I hope you had a nice February break. Good. <laughs> One person did. Uh, please all close your laptops. <laughs> okay, so last time we talked about um, the following thing. We said, well, we have, in machine learning, we usually have a data set D that is drawn from some distribution P x comma y, right? And we have n data points, and this is to the power of n. Um, so there's this, this distribution that we don't know about, and from this distribution, we have IID draws uh, that are basically making our training, we have n, n draws that are our training data. And this distribution will forever remain elusive to us, right? This is something we don't know. So, for example, if you have images of you know, faces or something, this would be the distribution of saying, if I go outside and I take a picture of someone, right, the probability of getting a certain face, we you know, with a certain label that's maybe the identity or something, or student or professor or whatever. Um, so that's some random distribution, but it's not a distribution that you kind of think of, in, in, um, you know, typically. Now, one thing you could do is you could think, well, if that's not too much, you know, uh, too complicated of distribution, we could approximate it, right? We could define some distribution that we understand that has parameters theta, and we say, well, we try to fit this distribution here to match the distribution that, you know, we don't know. Okay? And once we have this distribution, then we could, you know, use the Bayes optimal classifier, right? So all our problems would go away if we had access to this distribution. Then we could just use the Bayes optimal classifier, and we would get perfect prediction, right? Perfect in the sense we couldn't do any better, right? We, we, minimum possible error. So what we're saying is, okay, well, let's, let's you know, we can't, we can't have this, but we could estimate P. Let's call this P theta. There's some distribution that we understand and has the following parameters theta. And we try to match this, try to find this data such that this distribution matches this, this elusive distribution as much as possible. And, uh, well, we don't have access to this distribution, but we have access to n samples. This is our training data. So the question is, can we somehow find the parameters theta such that this distribution here, which we understand, you know, would give rise to our training data with high probability? And so we talked about Two, there are two different methods to do this. The first one is maximum likelihood estimation. In maximum likelihood estimation, we said theta, we find theta such that it maximizes the probability of the data that we observed. Right? So you basically say, you now I want to find the parameters theta such that if I plug these into my model, right, the distribution is very likely to give me the data that I observed. Right? And if that's the case, and for all means and purposes, these two distributions are probably pretty similar, right? Because if I sample data from them, I get you know, pretty much you know, very similar results. Okay? So that's the idea behind maximum likelihood estimation. So you want to maximize the likelihood that you observe the data that you did observe. Uh, second thing is maximum a posteriori, <laughs> a posteriori uh, estimation, where we say theta is uh, we flip things around, we say, given that we observe the data, what's the most likely theta? So we say, you want to maximize the probability of theta given that we observe the data. <coughs> now, the crucial difference here is that here theta is a random variable, whereas here it's not. Here's a parameter, and I made this clear by actually putting it kind of as a sub-index here. So this here is a frequentist approach where you say parameters are parameters, we fit them, whereas here we go into Bayesian territory, we say, well, this could also be a random variable. It's not associated with any random event, there's no sample space, we could sample theta, but let us, you know, let's not let us stop, uh, 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 let this stop us, we can still treat as a random variable, and then we can have a distribution, you know, um, uh, over theta, and that's the prior distribution. So we basically say, in order to do this, we have to have some prior distribution p theta that we define, and then we can actually do this fitting here. Uh, then finally, the last thing is, that's the truly Bayesian approach, that's saying, well, actually, these are, you know, these are just mapping, you know, these are estimating theta for a purpose, right? Why, why are we even interested in estimating theta? Because ultimately, we would like to make predictions. Ultimately, once we've done this, then we actually, what we want to do is we stick our theta into our distribution, we say, for a certain, certain test point, you know, uh, x, 
What's the probability of y? Right? That's the only reason we are doing this. So why don't we just do this all along? And that's the fully, you know, let me call this fully Bayesian approach. It's basically we say, well, if we just want to make predictions, then what we could actually do is the following. We could say the probability of y given x equals the integral of all possible models p of y given theta times p of theta given the data. And so here, basically, we get rid of the machine learning model. And that was what I was so excited about last time. I said, this is the most beautiful thing. In some sense, this is the holy grail, right? So a lot of machine learning people have kind of spent their entire career trying to find, you know, trying to solve this equation. They basically say, well, actually, machine learning, right? A, a, a traditional approach to machine learning is you have some training data. You fit a model. That's my theta here. These are the parameters of my model. And then using this model, I make predictions. In the fully Bayesian approach, what you're saying is my prediction averages out all possible models, right? And it weighs every possible model you could conceivably think of by the probability of obtaining that model given that the data that you observed. We will get to this in a little bit, like in a couple of lectures, but this is just a primer in some sense. Keep this in mind, right? Almost always, this is impossible, right? This integral is impossible to solve, right? For very obvious reasons, because these are very, very hard terms in here to estimate. But there is actually at least one algorithm where you can solve this in closed form. It's a very beautiful algorithm. Uh, and uh, so occasionally it works. What, what I really want you guys to you know, take home from last lecture is MLE, maximum likelihood estimation, and MAP. Okay? Where you basically say, well, there's two different ways of estimating, um, estimating a parameters uh, uh, from, from data. Any questions about this? It's going to be a quiz in two seconds. Yeah. Um, this is not the last patient, the two division one, but even if you integrate over theta, the distribution you choose remains constant. The distribution you choose stays constant. So that, that's just a distribution that you get out at the end. Yeah. A distribution. You just get a distribution out. That's right. right. And you marginalize out basically theta. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Any more questions? All right, so what we then did is, my hope was to put this, can I flip this around? No. Darn. Um, do I have space? I don't have space. Okay, do you mind if I erase this? Any objections? I hope you, you remember this, right? Um, Well, you know what? Why don't I show you a demo right now? So here we go. I have everything set up. Why not? OK, so here's what we did. Um, hey, what's going on? OK, perfect. So. Then what we did is we looked at the simplest possible case, right? The simplest possible case is we just have p of x. So we don't even have any y now. And this was just a coin toss. Uh, a coin toss. So you, you find some old ancient coin. You don't know if it's exactly biased. And you want to know what's the probability that this particular coin gives you heads, right? So that's the distribution you don't know. Now you sample some data. So you toss it 10 times. And three times you get heads and seven times you get tails. And now you would like to know, well, based on that data, can I estimate what the probability of heads is? And so we derived this, and we, what we found out is that with the maximum likelihood estimation, the, the answer of p of x equals heads was the number of heads divided by the total number. Right? And if you do map, then actually what we get is p of x equals head equals the number of heads uh, divided by the total number. Let me take this number of heads plus the number of um, tails, plus some terms here. So you actually have hallucinated heads and hallucinated tails. Uh, sorry, hallucinated heads. So hallucinate the heads and hallucinate the tails. That was if you put a beta prior over the distribution. So here the, the distribution that we, ha uh, that we put over theta basically translated into saying we hallucinate some tosses. So Essentially, what we are doing when we do map, we say, well, we have a prior belief over coins, right? So even if all our tosses are heads, 
I still don't believe that there's a 100% chance of getting hands, right? That's just my experience in life tells me this, right? That this may be actually an unlikely event, right? So what you do is you specify a distribution over your model beforehand, and you say, that's what I, what's I be, prior to seeing any data, this is what I believe my distribution over theta will look like, and then as I get more data, I basically, sh you know, shape the distribution, you know, I basically update this distribution over theta. So this here is the distribution P of theta given the data. So basically, in some sense, this is a, if the data is the empty set, you start up with some distribution that you believe are priori. And uh, so in, in terms of the coin toss, that, just add, that basically just means you just add a couple, a couple of imaginary results. You basically say, well, I start out with saying, initially I have a 50-50 distribution, so I just say I have 10 heads and 10 tails, and that's how, what I begin with, and then I, I start tossing them. Let me, I, I coded up a little demo, and um, let me just run this. So here's what I'm doing now as I say, um, I'm running, well here's my, Julia, okay, good. So what you see here is maximum likelihood estimate and map, and on the x-axis here is how many coin tosses I observe, and what you see here is the estimate of my probability theta, that's the probability of getting hats, okay? So basically after how many, after, you know, just a, uh, this is just, you know, one, one, uh, uh, just, you know, there's like a couple of coin tosses, basically. You get very extreme values, right? But then as you, this is logarithmic, by the way, after seeing 10,000 to tosses, uh, tosses, they all kind of approach 0.7, which is the true distribution, right? So I, I, I rigged the system saying this coin, in reality, has a 70% chance of resulting in heads and a 30% chance of resulting in, in tails. So after I toss it 10,000 times, you know, my estimate is basically right around, very much around 0.7. So after 10,000, you know, coin tosses, I'm pretty sure it's a, you know, it's a 70-30 uh, ratio. And the same thing with map. In this case, basically what I did is I said, I'm not, my map parameters were zero and zero. So I actually, map was basically the same thing as MLE, right? So I said I'm not hallucinating any coin tosses in either direction. What you see here on the left is my prior belief. So when I'm saying I'm not hallucinating anything, what does that mean? That means I have absolute and uninformed prior. That basically means my probability is just a, it's just a constant you know, here. So it's basically just saying, I don't know whether it's 1.0, but it's basically is a, look at the shape. So the shape basically says, any prob this here is basically the probability of, uh, uh, so this is the particular value of theta, and this is basically how likely I believe it is. And up front, I'm saying everything is equally likely. I have no prior belief. I can now run this again and say, okay, well, I'm hallucinating one heads and one tails to begin with. I'm running this again, and this is what I get. All right, so what you see here on the left, this here is my belief now, right? This is now translated into a beta distribution with parameter two, alpha 2 and beta 2. That means I really believe it's a 50-50 chance, right? That basically means that you know, I'm hallucinating an equal number of heads as tails. And what you can see here is MLE is unchanged because it doesn't affect anything, but MAP here in this case, basically because I hallucinated one coin toss as heads and one coin toss as tails, I start out with 0.5, and basically, you know, here we have much fewer extreme values. Any questions about this, this demo? Any questions about what, what I'm showing here, the different graphs? Yeah? For the left, this is actually the PDF, so this is the probability density function. Yeah. Yeah. I say one more time. No smoothing for MLE, which is ex that would be exactly map, right? So smoothing for MLE is map. Yeah. Any good, any questions? Yeah. Then actually, the, the prior is uniform. Right? So look at this prior here right now. I'm saying the prior is basically, I have a strong belief it's 50-50. It's right? There's some chances, you know, it's, it's biased into either direction. It's very unlikely that it's a one or a zero, right? And the reason that is because I hallucinated one heads and one tails already, right? So it can't be that it's all heads or all tails, right? It's not really possible, right? Um, if I, let me just show you this one more time. If I make this zero, zero, then basically my prior belief just becomes a flat line, right? I say everything is equally likely. I have no, no idea what it could be. Okay, does that make sense? It's called an uninformed prior. 
I'm not biasing the system in any way. Any more questions? I can now, for example, go up and say, well, what if you do 10, 10, right? So now I've just hallucinated a lot more. And what you see is that the prior becomes a lot sharper, right? Because I had 10, 10 uh, tosses already of heads, 10 tosses of, of, uh, of, of tails, I have a pretty strong belief it's 50-50. Now it's much more unlikely that it's even in the 0.9 range, right? And what you see here with MAP is that at the beginning, it's very much dominated by these hallucinated throws, right? So it believes basically it sticks to the 0.5 until it sees more and more heads and eventually moves up to the 0.7, okay? <clears throat> One thing you should observe that's important is in the limit, if I see it, you know, a lot of coin tosses, it doesn't matter, right? <clears throat> they both always end up with the same solution, right? Because at some point, the reality is going to dominate my, you know, my data. Right? But if I have very little data, then actually the data is dominated by these hallucinated tosses. Uh, and so <clears throat> one thing you can see now is because 0.5 is actually not so good, right? at the beginning it's a little bit off. Right? I could make this even more extreme if I do 100 and 100 or something. Uh, so now actually you see, it's kind of like, it, it's really, really confident right, that it's 0.5, right? which is not true, right? So the distribution here is, I'm, I'm dead, just like a, the confident teenager or something, right? It's like, it's really, really confident. Ah, no, it's this one, right? You're wrong, right? Uh, it has to see a lot of data to actually then get convinced otherwise, right, of reality. <clears throat> I apologize to any teenagers in the room, but thank you. <clears throat> <clears throat> and so you can see this is actually not a very good estimate, right? You need, after 100 samples, right, you're still way off, right? And actually 0.5, like, you know, you're ways away here, right? Whereas MLE is actually a lot better, right? So the important thing is that MAP estimate is good when you have little data, but if you actually have the wrong prior, right, then it's not good at all, right? So then you basically, then it can take you longer to converge. Another option is also, let me show you another example here where I'm actually um, running it. Sorry, where am I? Oh, here we go. Um, I could also just do three and, and seven, right? But actually, or two and eight, let's do this, two and eight. Where I say I only hallucinate not many, but I hallucinate two heads and eight tails, right? So I, I'm not sure about it, but my prior belief is that actually the probability of heads is pretty low, right? In this case, I'm way off. It's actually the other way around, right? And you can see it needs a lot of data to move up here, okay? On the other hand, if I'm actually right, let's say I'm actually correct, and I do... 7.3, for example, which is exactly correct, right? Then actually you see that map is really, really good, right? I'm starting out exactly where, where I'm supposed to end up. And, you know, I just get a little bit of variance here, and very soon I'm going to peter out, right? If I, I can make this even more extreme, as I do 70.30. 70, well, let's do 700, come on. Let's go all in. Right, so I'm really, really confident, and right, so I'm really, really confident there's a solution, and it ends up being the solution, so then in this case, of course, I'm dead on. Right. Any more questions about this demo? <clears throat> yeah? So, well, it depends, right? So, if you are right with your prior, if you're close, then it will converge much faster. But if you're wrong, right? If you do the following, if you do, you know, 800, 200. Oh, shoot. What did I do? Julia stopped. Oh, that's terrible. Um, one more time. Yeah, so, so here I'm actually... Oh, wait, this is the wrong way around. All right, so in this case, I'm very confident that it's, um, that it's down here, right? And the, that it's basically a 20% chance of heads, but it's really a 70% chance of heads, right? And you can see it doesn't converge for a long, 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 long time, right? Even after 1,000 samples, it's still way off. Look at this here. This is 1,000 samples, right? Here's where we are, right? We had 0.4. The answer is 0.7, right? It's really pretty bad, right? Whereas MLE at 1,000 is actually pretty good, right? So here at 1,000, it's actually right around 0.7, right? So it really depends on your, on your prior. And you can bias the, the answer, basically. So, Map is only good if your prior is, is, makes sense. Yeah. By the way, people, there's been these endless discussions in statistics, in statistics 
if people, you know, if you're allowed to have, you know, use Bayesian statistics or not, and if these priors are reasonable, right? And as part of this, people have actually done experiments where they want to figure out, is the human brain, is it frequentist or is it Bayesian, right? And so people did these bizarre examples where they, they went out to random people on the street and told them, you know, I have, a, I have a cake in the oven. How much longer should I keep it in there? I don't, you know, it's an impossible question. You don't know what cake, you don't know how, what oven, you don't know how hot the oven is, you don't know how long it has been in there, right? It, the question makes no sense. And people say, 20 minutes, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so basically what they want to prove is that, well, we have some prior, but you, don't, it's, no, it's not, you know it's not a decade, right? So it must be, you know, it's probably 20 minutes sounds about right. You know, I don't know, what is it, banana cake? Well, 20 minutes. <laughs> so, <clears throat> and so those are kind of the, you know, psychologists have, have, have basically had a lot of fun like, trying to find out, like, you know, do we have Bayesian or do we do frequent statistics? And it seems to be that occasionally, actually, we do, ha we do show tendencies of Bayesian statistics, but we actually have, you know, we do have certain prior beliefs, you know, that we basically use. That, that's, all, by the way, also related with our prejudices, right? And, and, and so on. We basically have uh, jump to conclusions um, because of our prior beliefs. <clears throat> all right. Chalk, chalk, what? All right. Any more questions? Okay, so let's connect this now to the more interesting parts of machine learning. So last lecture we said, okay, let's take the simplest case where P of, we just have P of X. What I want you to figure out now is what if we go a little bit more interesting, right? So what if we actually don't have this setting, which is not very interesting. What if we have the following setting? We have P of Y comma X, right? And so X can take on a few discrete values and Y can take on a few discrete values. And what I would like you to figure out now, and together with your partner, is the following, is what is the probability of P of Y given X, right? Let's say you have a data set now sampled from this. Um, how do you would use MLE to estimate the parameters theta for this, this distribution, okay? And just a reminder, in P of X, what we did is we did the following, P of X equals little x. We said the following, the answer is we sum over all the data set uh, in our, uh, in our data set, we said, well, whenever it's i equals x divided by n. Okay, so this here is the function that either gives 1 if this is the case, or 0 if not. So this here basically is the number of heads, right? Number of heads if this here is heads. Okay, so we said we count how many times we find x in our data set divided by the total. That ratio is the probability that we actually see x. Okay, does that make sense? Raise your hand if that makes sense. Okay, good. What I would like you to find out is what is the probability of y given x in the setting where you now have a joint distribution of two variables, label y and a single feature x. Okay, I'll give you maybe three, four minutes. Please discuss it with your neighbor and try to figure out what is the, uh, you know, what is the, the MLE estimate. Wants to volunteer the answer? Anybody? Yeah, good, you're brave. So you look at all of the values where x is equal to the x I've given, and then over that set, you find the ones that have that, the y that you're looking for, and you divide, you sum up all of them using that function essentially and divide by the number. Okay, good. Very nice. So what he's saying is the following. We have a data. We have, a data, uh, we have our data. We want to condition y on x equals x, right? So in some sense, what he's saying is this is not very different than what we did before with the coin tossing, except that now we are only looking at the cases where x equals little x, all right? So that, that's what we're conditioning on. So beforehand, basically, we had data where we said, you know, we have a bunch of data, we want to know what's the fraction of, of times we actually had heads. Now we do the same thing, we say what's the fraction of, uh, that we have heads, so that we have class label C, but only within the subset where x equals little x. Or let me put it another way, so we can actually say, you now we have the following, right, this is the, this here is the set where x equals x, 
This here is the set where y equals y. And what we're interested in is this here out of the circle where x equals x. Okay, so in some sense, we don't care about the case where x does not equal x. All right? <clears throat> I can also raise your hand if that makes sense. Okay, good. Another way of looking at this is the following. That is p of uh, y equals y comma x equals x divided by p of x equals x. That's just the definition. Right? Now, these two we can solve. This is exactly what we did before. Right? This is down here, this is uh, sum over i equals 1 to n i of xi equals x divided by n. Right? That's exactly what we had before. And up here we now have not just one condition, we have two conditions. Right? So, well, no big deal. Right? So we say i is xi equals x and yi equals y over n. And the two n's cancel. And what we get is exactly this ratio. We sum over all the points, it's exactly what he said. x equals xi and y equals yi. Sorry, yi equals y, sorry. xi equals x. Divided by the total number of points xi equals x. All right, so, so one more time, we go through our data set, we say, how many times do we see x? And out of those times, how, do we o how many times do we also see y equals y? All right, and that ratio basically tells us, given that you see x, x equals x, uh, what's the probability of y? Right? So one thing you could do is you can basically just say, well, just this one, one more way of looking at it, you just say, well, I take my data set, I throw away all the, all the samples where x does not equal x, right? And then I just estimate the probability of y equals c. Okay, does that make sense? All right, awesome. <coughs> Raise your hand if you got that result. All right, nice, nice, nice. <coughs> all right. Um, if we do... If we try to estimate p of y equals y, given x equals x, right? What we said is we just take our data set and we throw away everything, you know, all the data points, you know, where x does not equal x, right? Well, in the one-dimensional case, that may not be that bad, right? But imagine you have a high-dimensional vector, right? So you have a hundred-dimensional vector. So then really, you know, what you're saying here is you're saying that, you know, x1 equals x1 x2 equals x2, and so on, x100 or xd equals xd, right? So if you have a d-dimensional vector, you're specifying exactly every single value of the data point, and uh, you're throwing away all the data points that are not exactly the same, okay? So essentially what you're saying is, well, for a test point, how many, uh, uh, given a test point, you know, if you want to know the label of y, what you're doing is you just go through your training data and you say, how many times have I seen exactly that test point, right? And what, what was the label when I saw it? And you can see very clearly that, you know, if d is reasonably large, you will never ever have seen that data point again, right, before, right? So, I mean, if you have a face recognition system or something and you want to know, you know, let's say, you know, here's a picture of a person, is that a student or is that a professor, right? What you would do is you say every single pixel has to be exactly the same, right? Have I seen that exact image before, right? And was it the professor or was it the student, right? And then you just output that label. So really, this is not a very good algorithm, right? It's kind of, you know, you're not actually, you know, you will basically always have this empty set, okay? So that's why we can't really do this in practice. <clears throat> but there is a rescue, and the rescue is the naive base assumption. Who's heard of naive base before? Okay, good. Um, all right. So the problem is that estimating p of x, y equals y, given x, is really, really hard, right? And we can't really, we can't really do it because we basically tie together all these different features and say, when, we have, when have we seen exactly this combination of features before, right? And the answer is almost always never, right? 
So we can't make any predictions. All right, so naive Bayes turns things around. So in naive Bayes, and you will hear, there's actually, by the way, naive Bayes is written this way. In naive Bayes, you turn things around. So you basically say, well, instead of estimating p of y given x, I just use Bayes' rule and flip things around. So I say p of y equals y given x equals x. My Bayes' rule is just p of x equals x given, wait, which way do I do it? Yeah, given y equals y, times probability of y equals y, divided by probability of p of x. All right. <clears throat> so this is just a normalizer. Don't worry about it. This is p of y equals y. That shouldn't be a problem. Okay, because we usually only have a couple labels. So, if we, for example, in the example of, you know, is a person a student or a teacher, a student or a professor, right? Well, this is just the prior probability. If I take anyone randomly, is it the professor or is a student? That's just the ratio of students versus professors. That's not a big deal. If that's a spam filter, right? That's basically a spam filter. This will be is the probability is the email spam or not spam, right? So that's just you can just estimate this on your own inbox. It's not a big deal. This here is tricky, right? Basically, given a specific email. And let's say x are all the words in the email, right? It's basically a long vector of words. Is that spam or not spam, right? We've never seen that email before, so we don't know. <clears throat> so we have to, you know, this we can solve. This we don't worry about for now. And the question is, what about this guy, right? Well, it doesn't seem any easier, right? Given the label, what's the probability that we get exactly that email, right? So what's the probability that we have, you know, Given that it's spam, what's the probability that we receive exactly that email? Well, it's really hard to estimate, right? You have never seen that before. So, naive Bayes makes a crucial assumption. And you will see in a minute why it's called naive. Naive Bayes says that the features are independent given the label. So, let me explain what that means. That means that it says p of x equals x given y equals y equals, basically this is a vector with three dimensions. So what naive Bayes assumption says is each feature right, is ind independently distributed, it is independent from each other, given the label. So this equals alpha equals 1 to d, p of x alpha equals x alpha, given y equals y. So this here is the alpha dimension, right? That that takes on this particular value, okay? <clears throat> and I'm multiplying all these these different uh, features, you know, uh, I'm multiplying all them together to get this distribution. <coughs> let me let me make this clear in an example. So let's say you have an email, and the email can either be spam or not spam. What naive base assumes is that the way the email was written is that all the different words in the email are completely independent of each other, given that, you know, provided that I know the label. So in some sense, you basically have a monkey who just presses certain words, but he has two different typewriters, right? So that's each button gives you a word. And <clears throat> you have one typewriter for spam and one typewriter for not spam. And so the monkey takes, basically at the beginning, you make a decision, do you want to write a spam email or not a spam email? And then, Let's say you want to write a spam email, then you just take that typewriter for spam emails and you just add words randomly to the email, right? According to some distribution, that's the probability, uh, given that it's spam, what's the probability that this particular word occurs? Okay, and you just draw them randomly. Any questions? Yeah? Sorry, why? Oh, why are they independent? They're not independent. This assumption makes no sense, right? But if we make this assumption, then we can solve it. <clears throat> so, you know, sometimes you have to cut corners. We're cutting a corner here. It's a huge corner, right? <clears throat> so, yes, if you look at your emails, right, hopefully the emails you're getting are not independent words, right? <clears throat> but turns out if you make this assumption, then actually it's computationally tractable. And it turns out empirically that often, actually, this works fairly well. Right? So in many data scenarios, 
making this assumption, you're trading off something, right? You're trading off, you know, basically you make an assumption that doesn't really hold. On the other hand, now you can solve it really e efficiently. And it turns out you're not, it doesn't break things too, much, too badly. <clears throat> but yeah, it's a very good point. Any other questions? Can anyone think of a scenario where it's actually where it actually holds? Yeah. I have a question. Okay. Do people ever kind of partially make the assumption so they'll try it where they try to condition on two variables at a time instead of making completely independent? They basically go to the limit of how much you do computation. I see. I see what you're saying. So he's saying this is a very extreme assumption, right? Why don't you make everything independent from each other? Why can't you just make like partially, you know, it's like some parts of it independent of each other. Make the subject line independent of the main thing or something. Um, I, I've never seen this. It, it probably is too much, it, it's not worth it. There's, there's probably other things you can do with your computation that, that's more effective. But it's a, it's a fair thing to ask. <clears throat> any, can anyone think of any setting where actually, um, where they actually are independent of each other? Yeah? Uh, probably in sentiment analysis where you're trying to predict the sentiment of a sentence based on uh, individual sentiment of a word. I see. So sentiment analysis, uh, sentiment analysis is the case for, for example, where you have a, a text and you want to know is it positive or is it negative. Um, it's it's a, actually a scenario where machine learning uses a lot. Um, um, Anyway, while I'm at it, actually, it's actually a, a billion dollar industry. Um, so what people do is, let's say the new iPhone watch comes out. What people do is they just quickly write programs that quickly go through blogs and check are, the, you know, are they about the iPhone watch and are they positive or negative. Much faster than any human could read them. And they try to get a sense of do people like this or not. And if they do like it, then they buy Apple stock. And if they don't like it, they short sell Apple stock. And people can make millions of dollars, or billions of dollars actually, using these algorithms. Um, so, you know, think about this. <clears throat> if you make billions of dollars, let me know. Office hours, 9 a.m. Monday. <clears throat> um, so the question is, are they actually independent? I would still say they're not independent, right? Because even if you say it's a positive review, still the fact that I say Apple means it's probably pretty likely that I would say watch afterwards, right? So there is this, uh, they're not, you know, it doesn't, always, uh, it doesn't really work for language. Yeah. Uh, pixel homologies are very correlated, right? So if I have a green pixel somewhere, right, the likelihood that the one next to it is, is also green is, is pretty high, right? They're highly correlated, typically. Um, yeah? Sorry? Cards. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, th I think you think, so, so here's what I'm taking away from this. You're thinking in some sense in the right direction. You're thinking in terms of it as a graphical model. So if people, who's heard of graphical models before? Okay, you took, so for those people who take graphical models, they says what we have here is we have a vector, a label y, and that label y gives rise to the different features. And so, um, the, you, you may have this independence if you actually have that these fe the value of these features are tr is truly caused by the label. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, for example, let's say you have some, some uh, in medical, you have some disease, right? Why is, do you have a disease or not? And these are symptoms, right? But these symptoms are actually caused by the disease, right? So telling you that I have symptom X1 does not tell you anything else about symptom X2 if I already know if the person has the disease or not, right? Because the, the symptom is completely caused by the disease, all right? So in some sense, like, typically they would not be independent, right? So let's say you have a, you have a disease that may make you cause cough and may also give you a rash, right? The fact that you have a rash may tell you something that you're starting to cough because it may tell you that you have that disease which causes both. But if I already tell you why is you have that disease or you don't have it, then the two are truly independent of each other. Okay, does that make sense? 
<coughs> so if there's a causal relationship, right, then actually this is typically the case. Okay, any more questions? All right, so let's just work through it, how we do the, the estimation when we make that assumption. Oh, so yeah? Okay, yeah, you could, you could, so the question is basically, he said, I'm not just assuming they're independent, I'm also assuming they are IID, actually, right? They're actually uh, identically distributed. You don't have to go there. You could actually make them, you could actually make it more complex by having different distributions. Yeah, and we will get to this, actually, next lecture. That's right, it's a good point, good catch, yes. <clears throat> All right, good, so, um, <clears throat> well, if you make this assumption, this teeny little assumption, then actually it turns out everything works out very, very beautifully. So let me remind you of what the Bayes classifier is. Right? So the Bayes classifier says, for vector x, what I'm outputting is the most likely label. Right? So I'm saying argmax over y, p of y given x. All right? So that's just the Bayes classifier. I'm saying, for a certain input x, I look at my distribution, which I now know, and I pick the label y that is most likely, and that's what I'm outputting. Well, I don't know this distribution, but I can use Bayes' rule. I can that, that is argmax uh, p of x given y p of y over some uh, normalizer. And you know, I said earlier on, don't worry about it. Now you can see why you don't worry about it, because it doesn't contain y, right? So it's just a constant. Okay, this is p of x, you don't have to compute it, it doesn't matter. Because you're just looking at which y maximizes this, this term. Okay? So we can just take it out. This, does that make sense? Raise your hand if that makes sense. Okay, awesome, good. <clears throat> and now you want to maximize this thing. Here we make the naive base assumption. <clears throat> so we can now, well that is the same thing as argmax over y, the product over alpha, P of x alpha uh, given y uh, times P of y. And actually, maybe I should take this out to avoid confusion. This is outside of the product. Okay, so here, all I'm saying is this P of x given y <laughs> decomposes into a product over every single dimension. All right, this here is a naive base assumption. <clears throat> now this here is still a product of many, many small numbers, so it's, it's ugly. But what we can do is we can do the old trick, we just take the log. Right? So in computer science, you never multiply numbers. Right? Never ever multiply many numbers, especially probabilities. Because if you multi multiply probabilities, you always get zero up to machine precision. So what you do is you just say, well, that's the same thing as taking the log. <clears throat> and then you have log of py. Plus, and now you get a sum of alpha log of p of x alpha given y alpha, or given y. <clears throat> and this here is easy to estimate. And each one of these is also easy to estimate. Why is each one of these easy to estimate? Can anyone tell me? Some people. It's only one dimensional, right? So that's the key, right? There's only one feature given y, right? So that's no problem, right? So we just check how many times have we seen that particular feature, right? Uh, when we saw y, okay? So that's, that's no problem at all. Um, <clears throat> all right, and you know, we leave it at that, and we see, I see you on Friday. <laughs>